is Don Fancher. I am a partner at Deloitte. I lead the forensic practice at Deloitte, so forensic financial crime investigations, fraud investigations, things of that nature. And as you'll hear Ben and I talking, we have some things in common in, uh, in regard to that and in regard to this particular topic. I also lead our legal business services practice. And we are here today to talk about trust and synthetic information. Other terms that we could use besides synthetic information, but we decided that was the most uh, all-encompassing conversation uh, point that we could make today. But I'm very blessed to be uh, joined by some great panelists. We've got Ben Coleman, we've got Kate Grafe, and Bartley Richardson. And instead of me trying to introduce them to you, why don't each of you give a quick introduction for yourselves and uh, your organizations? Ben? I'm Ben Coleman. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Reality Defender. We are the leader in enterprise deep fake fraud detection across fake faces, fake images, and AI-generated text. And hi, everybody. My name is Kate Grave. I'm the VP of Enterprise Trust at Deloitte. And I work with organizations to help them understand how they are perceived by their customers, their workforce, their shareholders, how that perception then drives behavior, and what they can do to become more successful. And thanks, everyone. I'm Bartley. I work for uh, a small uh, silicon company you might have heard of, uh, NVIDIA. I'm the director of engineering uh, for cybersecurity and AI infrastructure. And so uh, our platforms that we're making, uh, hardware, software platforms for cyber, um, those are all of our engineering teams. Awesome. Thank you guys for being here. So why don't we start by actually defining that term that I used a few moments ago, synthetic information. What do we really mean by that? Obviously, we're approaching the one-year anniversary of the introduction of one of the most transformative generative AI capabilities and obviously a topic of conversation that was just in this room with Tanisha, one of my partners, and uh, her panelist. But Ben, I'd love for you to talk to us a little bit more about synthetic information. What do we mean around this multimodal capability and how does that relate to generative AI and all the things that have been happening for the last 12 months? It's a, it's a great question because education in the space is, is oftentimes lacking. When we think about synthetic information, we think about any modality, audio, video, images, or text, that has either been created from scratch using a large language model or a foundation model, or has then been manipulated using a neural net or other kind of transformative technique. This can be as simple as AI-generated text in your LinkedIn. It can also be as challenging as a face swap affecting an election or news item that's breaking online. Any other thoughts from you guys before we jump into a little more on that? Well, I think it's just interesting to observe how many use cases of synthetic information are possible, right? We first heard the term deep fake in 2017. Um, it was applied in social media because of how the face uh, swap technology was being used to put people in situations without their consent, right? But it's not just negative because there's so many applications across art, across technology, education. And so really looking forward to diving into that. Well, Bartley, I know you've got some thoughts on that, because you're right. I mean, the first thing we can think of when we think about synthetic information is, is negative. Our thoughts go to negative, the way bad actors might utilize these types of capabilities, and those are certainly there, and we're going to talk about some of those for sure. But it's not all bad. So, Bartley, uh, how would you describe some of the applications that could be applied here and the positive uses that we might see, as well as potentially the negative? Yeah, I, I think, like, just to echo what you said, Kate, um, our, our mind always goes to, to negative. I think that's what makes great news. Uh, obviously, that's what captures headlines. Uh, but there is this tremendous capability that we can harness with synthetic information. Uh, a few examples, right? One is, uh, is for training downstream detectors for rare events, right? So if you have an event that doesn't happen very often, think in healthcare, think even in cybersecurity, you can use some of these generative models to create massive amounts of data that then help you train these detectors that you know, uh, will help you pick up an event that you haven't observed or that you might never observe, right? Like these kind of one-offs. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge potential, right? And we see it across a number of different fields. There's also, uh, you see a lot of co-pilots, right? I think everybody has a co-pilot. Everybody's making a co-pilot. Everybody wants a co-pilot, right? Uh, there's going to be a, a Bartley co-pilot maybe in the future. I don't know. I'm sorry uh, in advance for that. But, uh, you know, 
that's that's just a, a great way to accelerate us as humans, right? We talk about accelerating the human, uh, the co-pilot, and being able to, to use that and really tailor that for yourself, your own assistant. I think these are all great use cases. You know, negatives, uh, I know we can talk more about it, um, but Kate already mentioned, you know, uh, do images and videos without consent. Uh, we have to be really careful about uh, content creators, right? Whether that's images, whether that is uh, text, whether it's audio, whether it's video. Uh, we want all of those, all those creators to still have rights over their property uh, and, and their creations. And so I think that's something that we as an industry really want to pay attention to as we're, as we're really accelerating the use of this generative AI capability. And Ben, how prevalent is this? So I mean, we're all in social media, we're on the web all the time. We've got web 3.0 facing us in the near future. How prevalent are these synthetic uh, images, videos and the like, and how do we start to really pay attention to them? I, I think, uh, uh, you have to take a bit of a step back on, on what it means for it to be synthetic. Um, all of us in here, if we have photos of ourselves or our families on the internet, are part of these massive data sets that are available because they're available to any company, whether they're doing good or bad. So first off, can we trust that our own photos are being protected? Probably not. And there's a whole regulatory and legal discussion going on there. But as far as truly synthetic media, you know, for example, uh, uh, synthetic voices. We're seeing that close to a third of all voice fraud, which previously required me to fake you or you one by one, now I can do it one to many. And I can take seven seconds of this recording, of this conference, and create a perfect voice fake of you. Although one, is, one of you is enough. <laughs> um, and use it to get through any kind of voice auth tool at my bank, at my broker, at my airline, at my credit card company. And what we're seeing now is that for this year alone, the forecast is half a trillion to a trillion dollars of cash fraud will happen purely due to voice fraud, which is made worse by the fact that these voice fraud tools are just one Google search away. Unlike a computer virus where you have to be a expert, full stack engineer, with these tools, you just Google it, find it, maybe you pay for it, maybe it's free, you can upload it immediately and damage somebody's finances, damage reputation, challenge a you know election, or cause different types of issues around hot button issues in the Middle East or in Asia. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that because one of the things that from a password perspective, password protection, we all know how fallible passwords can be. And so where a lot of industries have been headed is to more biometric uh, protections. To require it. But as you're talking about, that's fallible now. Absolutely. When you, they say your, your, your voice is your password, that is absolutely not the case. It's almost doing the opposite of giving the, the false sense of security. Because again, these off-the-shelf tools, without naming them, you can fake anybody's voice and get past any of those searches. So for us, for example, Reality Defender, we don't check for a person's face print or voice print. We're only focused on is the voice, is the face, is the video, is the text showing indicators of AI generation or AI manipulation. So from an industry perspective, let's talk that a little bit. So let's, let's not just look at the negative. It's very easy to go right to the negative. But let's look at the positive and the negative. So first question for all of you, from an industry perspective, what industries right now do you see being most impacted by these synthetic capabilities? Well, it's interesting because synthetic uh, media first emerged in the media industry. And actually one of the first applications or one of the applications that took hold uh, very prominently is adult films. And still to this day, there's been some research that shows that by and large, that application dominates synthetic information online. But that's changing. And so we're starting to see more and more um, synthetic content being created in fashion. We're starting to see applications to other industries, but that's still nascent. I think you know one of the um, 
elements that I want to talk about too is both the positive and the negative, right? Because it's so easy to gravitate to some of the challenges that synthetic information poses. But it's also creating a renaissance of human creativity and human potential because now we're enabling completely new forms of art and ability to create music and create immersive educational experiences where you can interact with you know, a historical figure and ask questions that are personal to you. That hasn't been possible before. And so there's a lot of potential that could be harnessed here. Now, at the same time, there is a dark side, and certainly there are malicious actors that for the first time ever can create disinformation at scale very easily, very cheaply, very rapidly. Um, and as a byproduct of that, society is becoming more distrustful, and we're starting to see legitimate content get questioned, and people wonder, you know, is this, is this material actually true? Um, and that's an effect known as the liar's dividend. So it's really important, and it's a timely discussion for us to prioritize media and technology technology literacy in this environment. I think the other place, uh, just to add on to that, uh, since you mentioned media, you know, adult film, is, uh, is gaming. Uh, and so we, you know, we don't think about it a lot, right, because we're not trying to make, you know, maybe an actual human in an actual video, but think about voices, think about, uh, like, your non-playable characters in video games. This will require teams of, of people to write that, uh, to motion capture like these things for, for games. And you hear about video gaming crunch all the time, right, where you know, these workers are working a, a lot of hours and, and it's a terrible condition. And so we can use this synthetic information, we can do the same type of thing, right? We can create these, these voice models, these character models, these images, and we can use that to populate these massive game worlds. And I use that as, as an example because it has a direct impact to the quality of those engineers and those designers and those workers downstream, right? So I'm always interested in how are we using this, this quote, like synthetic information and then synthetic generation capabilities uh, to kind of make people's lives uh, a little bit better, right? That's the goal, right? That's what every science fiction movie has promised me, uh, is that we're going to eventually make this better using these types of capabilities. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm here in Las Vegas, my team needed a video of me today, and they couldn't get a hold of me, and they made a fake version of me that actually looked great. <laughs> and I'm not a celebrity, but, you know, some celebrities, like, um, like Bruce Willis, we've, you know, we've heard that he's lost his ability to speak, and he has licensed his likeness to different brands who are making permission deepfakes. So, yes, they're synthetic, but they're also permissioned. So it's another good use of something beyond the course of what's available. Well, and one thing, and we even saw this if you were here at CES last year, you may have seen this, where, and it's more than just a deep fake or a synthetic, but it's, it's really using artificial intelligence and creating a synthetic human being, and it's being used in certain news agencies. And so in certain cultures where a news anchor is highly, highly trusted, and so the recipients of that news want to hear it from that individual, but obviously that person can't be in studio 24 hours a day. You can use this synthetic capability, which is a combination of the video and the voice. You train it such that any news story that then needs to be announced to the public can be done so at the you know, immediate moment that it's necessary without having to pull the anchor in. And so again, I think that's an important component to keep in mind is there are real opportunities here to make all of our lives easier, better, the data flow can be even more relevant for us if it's used properly. But as we know, we often have the negativity that, uh, that can come with those types of opportunities as well. And Kate, I actually want to turn to you because I know this is something you've studied greatly, and that's the impact of these synthetic or artificial creations from a geo geopolitical perspective. Talk a little bit more about that and some of the things that we're seeing. It really expands on what you were just talking about around disinformation, the liar's dividend, and the like. Well, first, let's define disinformation and misinformation, right? All of us participate on social media. Sometimes we see something that somebody has shared online. That's misinformation. They might not know that the information they're sharing is not true, but they're posting it anyway, and there's no malicious intent. Disinformation is information that is specifically created with the intent to mislead, right? Either for political gain, for economic gain, or for some kind of outcome. And so now it's very easy to create this kind of content and to do so at scale for the first time. And so it's very important for all of us as consumers to ask ourselves the question, you know, who's the author of the content that I'm 
looking at or consuming, what kind of content have they produced in the past, and what context is it situated in? Am I able to see um, you know, similar content online? And so we are, as you said, seeing this emergence of the liar's dividends, where people are posting content from war zones, from conflicts around the world, and we're starting to question, is it legitimate or is it fake? Because we don't have trust in the information that we see online anymore. No, and I think that's a real challenge for us. And so it's why this whole concept of disclosure, of representation, I think is super important. Um, so Bartley, Kate, you know, let's assume for a moment that there is no ill intent. What responsibility do organizations to have or even do we as individuals have to be transparent and to be forthcoming with the fact that this certain content is artificially created? Yeah, I, I think that's really, really the key, right? It's uh, it's going to take a village, right? Uh, for this, it's going to take technical capabilities. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, it'll take uh, obviously some regulation. It will take companies, you know, stepping up to this. I, I think one, uh, like you mentioned, being transparent. Uh, one, not just if something is generated or synthetic, but being even more transparent than we have been in the past as an industry about where the training data from this came from. What is incorporated in this particular foundation model? If we have a foundation model that's generating uh, images, that's helping you generate images, you, you subscribe to something like Adobe Creative Cloud and it can generate these images for you. How are these images being created based on what data went into their, uh, that training set for that? And you could talk about any model like that. Having that type of information not only available, but is available in a way that the average, whether that's a developer or a business person or a business decision maker, can consume it, right? We talk a lot in the industry about model cards and model card plus plus, right? But these in the past have really been written towards the, the uh, ML or the deep learning practitioners or the data science practitioners, right? You need to know uh, model weights and the, the actual structures of the models and all this. Having uh, easier to read nutrition labels, for instance, right? Uh, how can we make easier versions of that so that the person without a computer science degree or without a, you know, a master's or a PhD can really not just see it, but understand, oh, I'm using this model and it's been trained with this images, I know what I'm gonna get out of that. And the other thing is providing this capability to, uh, to companies so that they can train their own foundation models so that then they have the opportunity to be transparent, right? It's hard when you don't even have that opportunity. So taking this technology and kind of making it available will enable those companies to do that. I love the idea of a nutrition label for AI because transparency is the foundation of trust. And we've seen a couple of examples just in the last few months where we've had AI generated content that was masqueraded as either being human or having been created by a human. Right? Just think about, there were a couple of reports of media companies that were experimenting with synthetic content, but then attributing that to authors that didn't exist. Or even conferences that created you know, artificially created panelists to make it appear that their diversity uh, and representation was better than, than what it really was. I think where the gray area becomes really interesting is how all of us use synthetic information in our personal lives. So we're at CES, I wanna ask all of you, how many, has how many of you have created an AI headshot of yourself? So about maybe a third of the room, right? And it's fun, it's really fun. You upload 10 to 15 pictures of yourself, you decide which ones to use, and then you get dozens and dozens and dozens of images back. And I did this recently, and what was interesting, Don, was that I found myself almost shopping for the smile that I like best, the hairstyle that I like best, and at the end, I had this perfectly I don't awesome have to worry picture. about the hairstyle. <laughs> Although maybe I could with the synthetic version of myself, I could go back to the hair I had 25 years ago. But there's so many choices, right? There's so many choices. And so I came away with a, an image that was perfect glossy and then the question becomes what if I use that image on my social media and claim that that's my headshot right what impact am I having on my self-esteem on my daughter's self-esteem if we're taking all of those flaws that make us human and we're completely eliminating them because we're creating perfect content so I think that's a really interesting question and I would just ask all of you right would you be able to tell which one of our images are synthetic and which ones are real what do you think and I think the, the comment you guys both mentioned on regulation or lack of regulation is a really 
paramount issue. You know, currently on the platforms we use in C, they, they do nothing because there's no regulation to do anything. So pick uh, your favorite social media or streaming platform. The only way to find out a thing may be indicatively fake is because a million people flagged it and there's community notes. But that's an analogy of like putting the toothpaste back in the tube. It's already out there, it's already been reshared. And where other countries that are further ahead than us, whether it's in Asia and Taiwan or Japan or Singapore or even EU or UK, is that the onus is on the platform to flag that media may be synthetic and not on the consumers. You never hear a world saying, hey, can you check to see if this email has a computer virus? Can you read the code? We don't because regulations require the platform to check for it. Same thing for CSAM imagery of underage people, same thing for violence, same thing for checking if your YouTube video has trademarked music, which it checks for it during the upload process. This is a natural delineation of those as well, and the fact that regulations don't require that right now is really frustrating because it only hurts us, the consumers. So we're gonna talk a little bit, I know Bartley, you're gonna talk in a few minutes about that, a little bit more about regulations, some of the requirements, things of like that. So I wanna come back to that point, uh, and I've got a couple of other questions on it, but let's take a bit of a shift as a, you know, we've been describing a lot of the impacting factors, the process here, but as our title in our talk talks about, we're also here to talk about trust the impact that this has on people's ability to trust the data that they are consuming. So Kate, maybe take a few moments and actually define what trust is, what we mean by trust, and how that then comes into play with these topics. Well, we've been studying trust at Deloitte for several years in a really rigorous way. And what we found is that in the context of business, trust is earned by demonstrating high competence and positive intent, right? And so that means that you have to provide goods and services to people that they can trust, that are reliable, but you also have to be perceived as having a good motivation for doing so. And so all of that is underpinned by what we call the four factors of trust, capability, reliability, humanity, and transparency, which, which Bartley mentioned. Now, we've gone a level deeper to understand where organizations earn or lose stakeholder trust. And we've uncovered 18 domains ranging from customer experience, workforce experience, regulatory compliance, data integrity and protection. And when you think about synthetic content, it impacts all of those areas, right? The, the impact is quite substantial. So I think as an industry, we have to ask ourselves the question of what impact does synthetic information have on trust. We have started to study this topic and we found that when customers know that a brand is using synthetic information and synthetic content, trust for that brand actually decreases. But the decrease is smaller when consumers understand what it's being used for, what are the benefits of that use, um, and so there are ways that organizations can engender that trust. But it comes down to competence and intent, right? Can we trust that the information synthetic content is producing is, is reliable? And what impact is it having on people? All right, so we've defined trust and transparency. One of the things that's very key to that, beyond the competence, the transparency also obviously relates to that intent and what the intent is of the organizations pursuing it. So, Bartley, back to the conversation we were having a moment ago, a little more around government policy, government regulations. You know, what can we really do to ascertain the authenticity or the awareness of these type of multimodal capabilities. Yeah, why don't, why don't we just solve that real quick? <laughs> right. um, you know, uh, we'll just we'll take that off, right? No, I, it's it's a good question, and I know uh, you know a lot of people are working on it. Uh, I'm from D.C., right? So if you're from the states, uh, you know I feel your pain, right? Uh, in uh, in D.C., I think some of that uh, we're doing or at least we're starting on the, on the right track, right? When you look at these types of regulations, obviously having, having standards from an organization like NIST, right, is going to be very beneficial. Um, they, are, they, they are a trustworthy organization. They're able to set these for companies, whether they're companies like NVIDIA that's making the tech, companies like Deloitte, you know, any, any company they can kind of set these common standards and guidelines. And I think we're very quick, you know, you see a lot of debate over the various different kind of standards that they're, that they're setting or they're talking about or in the RFCs, right, that they're putting out. And we're very quick to say this 
this won't work, it's not enough, it's, you know, but I think, I think that kind of misses part of the point, right? And part of the point is we, we have to start somewhere. Uh, and I like to be a realist, right? We're going to, we're going to do this, uh, and we're going to take a first stab at it, and it's not going to be perfect. Uh, and we're going to improve it uh, as we go along. Uh, I think the key, though, like Kate said, is there's so much onus being placed on the consumer, and if we can make these standards that, you know, force or, you know, um, for some other way, compel transparency and push that onto the companies or to the organizations creating the synthetic content, creating the models, uh, that's a great start. Building it into platforms, like Ben mentioned, it is also a, a really great idea. Again, it takes that onus and displaces it into another, uh, into another area. And the, and the other thing I like to say, you know, I'm a, I'm a cybersecurity person, right? So coming from that background is we're going to do all of this stuff, right? We're going to create new standards. We're going to make transparency. We're going to put it in the platforms. But the, the terrible secret is you still have to do all of the other security things, right? Uh, right? None of the other security things go the way. So you have to make sure that the models that you've taken all of the time to make sure you know what the content was that was trained those models, how it's working in production, how it's working in your training environment, how are you securing that particular model? How are you securing that particular infrastructure as an organization offering these capabilities, right? We, we need these new things that we just talked about, uh, but it's also important that none of these other security things, making uh, confidential enclaves, making secure models, making secure pipelines, all that stuff has to come with it as well. Well, I think it's important too. So kind of going back to the conversation you had a moment ago and, and using the, the nutrition labels as an example, or for those of you old enough like me to remember the good housekeeping seal of approval, was something that was out there that, you know, for basically consumers to know, oh, this is a good product. We can rely upon this product. You have to create these reliance type of situations. And I think in that same vein, do we need a situation, first of all, where we're, we're both giving proof of real content as well as transparency and recognition of synthetic content? so that you're actually having to do both, as opposed to having people guess, well, I assume since it doesn't have anything that says it's synthetic, it must be real. Is, is that, does that make sense? I think it makes sense to me. Oh, sorry, Kate. Uh, no, I, I think it makes total sense, right? And, and I think, you know, that, that's you know, this type of disclosure, right, that you're talking about. I don't know if it's as, as prevalent as the good housekeeping. I remember the good housekeeping, or, or if you, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, what was it, the, the Nintendo seal of quality, right? Like following the big, you know, video game, uh, you know, like this is great. Uh, something like that, uh, I, think, I think is important. We, we see it a lot, not a lot, but we are start, starting to see it with companies that are at the forefront of this generative AI uh, kind of um, technology and prep passing it on to consumers, right? I think it's important that trusted brands, right, to go back to the Kate, uh, kind of adopt this and really kind of buy into that whole thing, right, as well to, to help, yeah, again, engender that kind of trust. Good NVIDIA seal of approval, maybe? The NVIDIA. <laughs> um, we, we can debate that, right? Like, yeah, I mean, our logo on, on other, on stuff is great. Yeah, sure. But I think that is a really important point because I think what it highlights is the fact that to your comment earlier, it takes a village. It does take government regulation, but it also takes our corporate entities making sure they're responsible for following through on this, driving this type of purpose for consumers, and then as human beings, as individuals, as, as our persons, that we're also doing the same, that we're also falling in line, for lack of a better phrase, in providing that type of safe, secure transparency, even with our own uh, you know, content that we're putting out there because so much of social media, which then so much of, as, as you guys know, drives all of the data that fuels artificial intelligence. It's being driven by us as human beings, as individuals. And so having a responsibility across all of that will be really important. But there's another aspect to this, Ben, and I want to I wanna get to this now a little bit more with some examples you have because as much as we'd like to trust individuals, corporate organizations, uh, state actors and governments to always do the right thing. We know that's not the case. And so the business that you and I are both in, in different realms of looking for fraud, looking for misrepresentation, disinformation, and the, and the like, cyber attacks, et cetera, 
those are all so prevalent. You need organizations that are in fact tracking this on a regular basis, calling out when this transparency is not there, calling out when, whether it's a bad actor or just an inadvertent, like some of the media suggestions you had, Kate, an inadvertent use, that you have people checking on this, tracking it, following through with it. So talk a little bit about you know, the context uh, from your perspective and some examples you have of how we do that. How it's created, first of all, I think, and then how do we also begin to defend against it? Sure. For the, um, you know, for the engineers and researchers in this room, you, you guys know you could grab different... By the way, tell me when I need to push put to your different slides. So, oh. uh, go ahead. Is this one? There we go. Sure. Uh, for those of you who are full stack in the room, you know you could go on to Stack Overflow or GitHub and download an open source model and then start playing with it and tuning it. But for the non-technical folks in the room, whether my... Uh, you know, my, my mother was in the room. She would just go online and Google um, fake voice generator and go to PlayHT or Eleven Labs. And without doing much, um, anyone could pick a number of pre-contained voices or they can, they can take your voice and with seven or eight seconds, maybe a little bit more, can fine tune it again as non as a technical person and then make you say really anything that we want. You'd think there'd be some filters, but the filters don't really work. So it could be about elections, could be about politics, could be about things you know, much, much worse, whatever the imagination can, can think of. And again, these are available to anybody. Anyone at any level can create any kind of misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, um, fake voice pretending to be a loved one, calling you saying they need money, they're in trouble, which has happened to me personally. And for those of you in the audience, it may happen to you in the near future. And so these tools are available to anybody without any checks and balances. And while there's a lot of phenomenal great use cases, the dangerous use case is what keeps us up at night at Reality Defender. We have a video of this. All right, let's listen to this. Hi, it's Ben. I have some bad news. Our IT systems have been hacked. The hackers have access to all company emails and texts between employees and our partner organizations. I am concerned about exposure of our IP and reputational risks if any of our employees' personal texts are leaked. The hackers are asking for a payment of $5 million by 5 p.m. today. They will send wire instructions to you and me by email. I authorize my team to make this payment right away and hope you will do the same. Thanks. Just really scary that this is even possible. And at a much lighter level, um, a few weeks ago, one of my team members called me from the Apple store saying, how many gift cards do you need? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, you, you just called me and texted me saying that we needed to buy you know, 100 gift cards, which seemed reasonable, I guess. <laughs> so this type of issue is, is dramatically increasing. Um, and what's also interesting is that it's mostly disproportionately affecting non-technical businesses. So. Um, plumbers, construction, folks that are making sizable wire transfers on a daily basis with probably not the same types of accounting and back-end organization of traditional financial firms. And here we're showing a version of our front-end software. While we do have an API, so you could scan millions of assets in real time, for a non-technical user, you could simply drag and drop files, whether they're audio clips, phone calls, recordings, videos, YouTube links uh, or text and get immediate insights with a probabilistic score of how confident we are it's AI generated or not and which AI models may have been used to create it. Now for the math folks in the room, we're doing inference not provenance, so it's purely probabilistic, it's not deterministic, but we'll show you where within the audio spectrogram or within the video or the frame or the text will color code where we're most confident AI has been used given that an article can have AI and human writing or a video or image can be your face with certain attributes affected or changed or perhaps my face put on your face. So clearly we need to be diligent. Uh, we need to be, oh wait a minute, is there more here? Yeah, just show shines the movement. Oh okay, it's got the, I'm sorry. But, but again, we, we target this exclusively to large enterprises. We are not consumer facing. And so the owner should be on those platforms to programmatically scan and flag items, which they can do in real time. Now, whether consumers can or should use this is a whole different conversation, but right now we're looking toward our friends in Washington, D.C. to really put 
regulations in place to protect consumers from something that you know, they can't tell, real versus fake, let alone experts on my team, we can't tell real versus fake with our own eyes. Great. So we've got the, the combination of us being diligent, we have the combination of hopefully organizations, people being transparent, and then organizations like Reality Defender that are following through this process, double checking, confirming, identifying challenges. But Kate, clearly all of us, whether it be corporate or personal, we, we really need to have a better level of understanding from a media perspective, a literary perspective, just you know, how we can understand the impact of this, uh, this artificial creation of content. So what does that look like to you? Yeah, I think this topic is incredibly important and it's very urgent for all of us to understand how we responsibly produce media, but even more so important, how to consume that media and how to critically think about it. So this technology is getting better every single day, right? And at some point it will be impossible to tell what's synthetic and what's real, but I think today there's still some things and some characteristics that you can look for. And the mnemonic device that I like to think about is faces, right? So first, what is the format of the content that you're looking at? And what forum did you see it in? Is it a, re a reputable forum? Who is the author? Who's hosting that content, right? Is that clearly designated? And what kind of content have they produced in the past? Next, you would look at context. What are the actions that they're prompting me to take? Am I seeing the similar content elsewhere? Can I verify that? And next comes emotion. This is the hardest part for AI to fake today. Um, and so you would look for things like infrequent blinking, um, jittery movements. Um, in the case where we heard Ben's voice, there was a part where he said email, but it sounded very robotic, right? So it was a little bit of a giveaway. Um, and this technology is gonna keep getting better. And then lastly, you would look at skin, right? You would see, is there an artificial glow? Are there any shadows that are misplaced? Are there any instances of flaws that I would expect to see, right? Are there pores? Are there veins? Are there wrinkles? Um, because all of those things tend to be kind of glossed out. But at the same time, the technology keeps improving. I think the applications of synthetic content are going to uh, keep proliferating. And so it's important to have both uh, standards from an industry perspective, the technologies that can detect it, and the regulatory backing to make sure that we can trust the information we consume. It's a reminder that we all have to be diligent. So just like we all have to be diligent around cyber scams, phishing scams, things of that nature, this is another area where diligence is really required, and, uh, and we all have to work and practice on that. And, you know, Bartley, any thoughts about how we as individuals can actually protect ourselves in regards to this, uh, these Deep fakes? Yeah, um, I, I love the mnemonic device, by the way. Uh, that's really, I'm gonna plug that again. Um, so that that's really great. You know, I, I think, I'll go back to something I said earlier. It, it really, you know, the individual is part of this kind of like, you know, it, it takes a village. Um, it, it, I think Kate summarized it much more than I could summarize that potential part. The, the thing I would add to it is, the underlying tech, right, for the synthetic uh, image generation, you know, LLMs and generative AI is the biggest transformation in technology, right, in, in modern history. It's gonna be absolutely transformative. And I, I've seen different takes on it all the way down to, if you're talking uh, education, right, early education, middle education, high school education, and do we, do we teach this? Do we allow you know, this type of content to be used uh, in schools, right? Are we letting them use it for assignments, all these types of things? My, my opinion, right, we're at this huge shift, there's this big paradigm shift on how things are going to operate, is as individuals, we should be investing in that education as well, right? So rather than say, oh, we want you to write all of these essays, right, by hand, and you have to write it in cursive, right? We stopped teaching cursive here in the U.S. a long time ago, I think, uh, right? My kids get not do cursive at all. <laughs> exactly, right? Uh, as times change, right, we, we have to, you know, prepare uh, the prepare kids, prepare people coming up for this type of thing. And I think it does two things. It lets them in an education environment get more practice at identifying what is real and what is not real. And also gives hopefully 
really great examples of here's how to use this technology, right, as well. Here's how to use this uh, technology ethically, responsibly. Uh, here's where you would use it, where you would not use it. And, and hopefully it becomes as, uh, as commonplace as not writing in cursive, right? No, I think that's really important. Kate, what do organizations need to do to prepare their workforce in this area? Very important question, because how can we trust that the workforce is consuming information and discerning what's true and, and what's not true? And so I think it comes down to people, process, and technology, right? It's just like putting cars on the road. Think about how many things go into that to make sure the cars are safe, that we're teaching people how to drive them, that we have the traffic lights, right? So it's the same thing. It's making sure that the workforce is trained, that there are policies and procedures in place to make sure that it's being used appropriately, and that there are technologies that can be the backstop when we really need that authentication of whether or not something is true. So we've got a couple of minutes left to wrap up. Um, I'd love each of you just to talk a little bit about can we get to a point where there is trusted synthetic information or is that concept really a paradox? Ben, I'll start with you. We, we took a probabilistic view on this and so our challenge is how to educate folks on what an 88% confidence level means. Uh, in that vein, I think yes, but we'll probably need some help from Deloitte on how we he, demonstrate that with color coding or our <laughs> charts. Yeah, I think yes as well, but I think we need three things. One, we need to understand who created the content. Two, we need labeling to know that that content was synthetically created. And three, exactly as Ben said, I think we need the education for people to understand how to consume it. Yeah, uh, I, I, think we'll, I think we'll get there. Uh, I think the, the part I would reinforce is what Ben said, right? Like, uh, are we, our world is filled of shades of gray, right? And so are we ever gonna get to the point where you can tell 100% yes or no, right? Like this is synthetic in every single instance, no. So it's gonna be this, this spectrum and having people not only identify where the content is on the spectrum, but how much do they care about where it's at in the spectrum, right? I think is important, but I, I think we'll get there. And I think for the topic that we're talking about here right now, and especially in light of the issue of trust, and trust being so important. It's always important. It's important for every part of our lives. It impacts every single thing that we do. This is another added complication, if you will, but it's also an opportunity. And so we hope that each of you will take a little bit of this data, and in your own personal lives and in your own corporate lives, find ways that you can help advance this process, because it's not going away. It is here, and as you said earlier, Kate, we're just at the beginning, and all of these capabilities are only going to get better, which means our diligence and our responsibility only gets more enhanced as well. So my thanks to each and every one of you for uh, sharing your thoughts on this very important topic, and my thanks to all of you for attending today. Thank you so much. Enjoy CES. Oh, do you want to do that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, we did put these on the chairs for everybody. You're welcome to take a look. Um, and we have a little bingo game, so Ben... Uh, uh, you want to lead us on uh, on this a little bit? If anybody can pick and choose the uh, deep fakes, we, we at Reality Defender want to demonstrate just how challenging it is even to experts in this room, and so uh, we're giving away 20 Nintendos. They're actually 20 fake Nintendos with over a thousand games <laughs> on them from Amazon.com. But um, if you can identify the deep fakes on the sheet, we will send you a fake Nintendo with a thousand games uh, today. So please feel free to share it, and um, we're hoping to evangelize it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Ben.